What if the Earth could speak? This is actually sunrise over the Coral Sea in Queensland, Australia. The psalmist says, day after day, the skies pour forth speech. What was that sunrise saying? What is Palm Sunday about? Palm Sunday is one of these Sundays that, as a preacher, you revisit every year. And Jesus is the true King of Israel. Creation is welcomed, sort of. The true King of Israel and creation, and he's sort of welcomed. You get that sense in the song that, that we just sang during the offertory. There are subtle ironies in this day where Jesus is hailed as king and rejected, and then, of course, later in the week, killed. And as a preacher, one of the things that you deal with in terms of this passage is that there's all this long story about the donkey, and then a little bit of welcoming, and that's it. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. He approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, and he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Now, usually when we read it, we just kind of skip over this, but that is actually one of the most important phrases in the earlier part of this passage. A colt that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. Now, there's, there's sort of a Star Wars moment in this story, which is highlighted, that these are not the droids you're looking for. A very famous line in the old Star Wars movie where Obi-Wan just kind of, <laughs> with his Jedi mind trick, kind of waves his hand, and the stormtroopers while looking at the droids they're looking for, just kind of goes on. Well, this is very much a reverse of that, because the Jedi mind trick, Obi-Wan, in a sense, lies to the stormtroopers, where the followers of Jesus come and say, the Lord has need of it, and then the owner says, okay, take the colt. But that's not really the miracle story. Because the miracle story, and why this is remembered, and why this is repeated is pretty much lost on city folks. Because anybody who grows up around animals, especially mounted animals, knows if you take an animal that has never been ridden and you try to get on that animal, those animals have a lot of way to get the person off their back. And in fact, you have, you, you have whole rodeo shows that are devoted to the fun of watching animals get the rider off their back. And, and so then you kind of wonder, well, what kind of a trick is this on Palm Sunday, where Jesus takes a colt that has never been ridden, and it's borrowed, so it has never been broken, and they put their cloaks on it, and Jesus rides it into the city. And now I don't have a lot of I don't have a lot of experience on the backs of animals. One of my more memorable trips on the back of an animal was when I was visiting a, a church way up in the mountains in the Dominican Republic, and they thought that it would be an important thing that the missionary not get too out of breath on his way up the mountain. So they sent a mule down there and put me on the mule, and we took, I don't know, maybe a couple of hundred feet up that mountain, and that's about all it took for that mule to figure out that the guy in his back was a pretty heavy American, unlike a lot of these smaller Haitians that usually rode him. And the mule's pretty smart, knowing that the brook where the mule always waters is down at the bottom of the mountain. And the mule also figured out that this guy in his back really didn't know what he was doing. 
So that mule just turned around right in the path and ran right back down to the bottom of the mountain with me on it. And that mule was trained. Jesus gets on this colt and rides not just on some path, but rides through a crowd of people yelling. Now, what would that do to that animal? That would spook that animal. But that animal goes right down the path. Now, this miracle story escapes us almost every year, but actually, this miracle story is integral to Jesus being welcomed into Jerusalem, Jerusalem as the city of the great king, the great king, in fact, of all the earth. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. In fact, they all knew they were watching one. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And those of you who are accustomed to being in church on Christmas might think that that last line sounds a little familiar. And you would be right. Because if you go all the way back to Luke 2, we have the story of Jesus in the manger and the shepherds in the field and the angels coming down and singing their song to the earth at Jesus' birth, they sing glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And now the people of Jerusalem are singing back to heaven, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And what this means in the Gospel of Luke is that the circle is complete and earth is finally beginning to do what it should always have done, which is reflect back the praise to the Creator God for the goodness of His creation. And right there at that moment, heaven and earth begin to come together if just for a moment. This is not lost on the religious leaders who are not happy to see Jesus. In fact, as we have heard, they were plotting his death. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're saying things about you that are too high to be said to any man. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And that's a strange thing to say if you don't know what's going on. Now, I think part of what, and those of you who watch my videos will have heard this before, there's been a modern reduction of God. Theology has classically said that God, there are two sets of attributes that God has. God's eminence, which is his closeness and his integralness to all creation, and God's transcendence, which is his aboveness and his mastery of all creation. And so God imminent attribute set number one, as I'll call it this morning, is the imminence of God. And the angels declared in the book of Isaiah, the whole earth is full of his glory. When you go to Yosemite National Park and you go into the valley and you stand over where the buses let the tourists out by Bridal Veil Falls, if you sit there and you're quiet and you'll watch, you'll see people come from all over the world, they'll step off the bus and they'll say, <gasps> because they see El Capitan and they see Bridal Veil Falls and they see Half Dome. And whatever they say their religious beliefs are, they pause and they see God's glory built in to the rocks, built in to the waterfalls, built in to the valley. 
The God of creations whose, whose fingerprints are everywhere. What happened in the 17th and 18th century is God sort of got reduced to something they called providential deism. That God made the world and left it alone. But the Bible doesn't see it that way. And after Darwin, we began to even doubt he was around. The other set of attributes, the transcendent attributes, are the God who is relational, the God who calls Abraham and wrestles with Isaac, the God who comes in the flesh, the great king who is coming to this city. But it's important that when Jesus comes, he's both. And the city recognizes him, but not just the city, the earth itself. You see, there's, there's two ways bad in this. Because we doubted the imminence of God and tried to suppress him in nature. And we compensated with the transcendent God and we forgot that nature also serves her king. And at the same time, resists us. And if you want to find where that story is, look in Genesis 3. Because when we again rebel against God, Nature looks over at us and says, well, I don't need to listen to you either. And right away, you see in the curses of Genesis 3, God says to Adam, the ground will resist you. And God says to Eve, your childbearing faculties will resist you. If you look back in the Bible, you see this language is, all over the place. Psalm 96, 11 through 13. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. The Bible is the story of the reconciliation of heaven and earth. And so you'll find those two paired all the time. Let the fields be jubilant. It's, it's if you ever get a chance to go to Jack's farm with Jack. Watch how Jack enjoys the farm. And when you go down there and you see his, his fields planted and they're coming to fruit, the fields are jubilant. But they don't say the word, but it's built into them. Just like awe is built into Yosemite Valley. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. And notice how often judgment comes into these passages. For he comes to judge the earth. And you say, what does that mean? He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Psalm 98, let the seas resound. And everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. You remember that song that we sing that goes all the way back to St. Francis. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with them sing. Hallelujah. That's a Palm Sunday song. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes. To judge the earth, he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. We sing that sometimes. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of the briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. And this interesting one in Habakkuk, where the house rebels against the unrighteousness of its builder. Woe to you who builds his house by unjust gain, <coughs> setting his nets on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. 
the stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. It is not uncommon when people come sometimes during the week and the lights are off, it's all quiet in here, for people to say, oh, can I just walk come in your sanctuary? Sure, come on in. And what do they always say when they come in during the week? I feel peace in this room. And you have to say, well, that's interesting. How? Why? Has, have the praises of God somehow inhabited <coughs> the space? What if the world is as the Bible says it is? What if God is the author and we are agents in his story? What if nature is our older creation sister and in our rebellion she no longer wishes to listen to us? So we enslave her and force her to do our bidding with technology, against which she always finds a passive-aggressive way to get even. Did you ever know that usually when we fix things to try and make it to our liking, there's always some other sneaky way that around the back nature comes to say, well, I'm not really going to give you total dominion over me. What is nature? C.S. Lewis actually writes about this quite a bit in his book, Miracles. In the same way, and for the same reason, only supernaturalists really see nature. You must go a little way from her, and then turn around and look back. Then at last the true landscape will become visible. You must have tasted, however briefly, the pure water from beyond the world before you can, before you can be distinctly conscious of the hot, salty tang of nature's current. You must go a little way from her and then turn around and look back. Then at last the, the true landscape will become visible. You must have tasted, however briefly, the pure water from beyond the world before you can be distinctly conscious of the hot, hot salty tang of nature's current. To treat her as God or as everlasting is to lose the whole pith and pleasure of her. Come out, look back, and then you will see the astonishing cataract of bears, babies, and bananas, the immoderate deluge of atoms, orchids, oranges, cancers, canaries, fleas, gases, tornadoes, and toads. If you go and watch one of these Planet Earth documentaries, there's absolutely a riot of the strangest creatures you could ever imagine. And there's things that are powerful and awesome, and other things like mosquitoes that we scratch our head and say, why are they here at all? And on and on and on and on, and nature is wild and wonderful and fearful and terrible. And all of those things together, and C.S. Lewis says, take a step back and look at it with awe, with wonder, and with fear. She is not God. She is not to be worshipped. But she ought, be, ought to be respected. And we should see something of her creator through her. How could you have ever have thought that this was ultimate reality? How could you ever have thought that it was merely a stage set for the moral drama of men and women? She is herself. Offer her neither worship nor contempt. Meet her and know her. If we are immortal, and if she is doomed, as the scientists tell us, to run down and die, we shall miss this half-shy, half-flamboyant creature, this ogress, this hoyden, this incorrigible fairy, this dumb witch. But the theologians tell us that she, like ourselves, is to be redeemed. The vanity to which she was subjective, subjected by us was her disease, not her essence. 
She will be cured in character, not tamed, heaven forbid, nor sterilized. We shall still be able to recognize our old enemy, friend, playfellow, and foster mother, so perfected as to not be less, but more herself. And that will be a merry meeting. Lewis is saying basically what Romans 8 says. Nature awaits for the children of God to be revealed because she is awaiting her restoration as well. At the end of the Bible, you have the story of new heavens and new earth and us in our proper place within them. Look at Jesus' miracles. C.S. Lewis notes, water to wine is just a speeding up of what's happening in the vats over there in Napa or Lodi at every moment. Multiplication of bread and fishes is what happens in the oceans and in the rivers and in the fields. Stilling a storm. Storms are stilled every day. Jesus just calls for it to happen, and it does. Walking on water, Jesus bids the water to hold him up and invites Peter onto it as well. But what does Peter do? He takes his eyes off Jesus, looks down at nature in its terror, and sinks. At Christmas we sing, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. This is the Palm Sunday where the palms get to speak. The palms don't talk. We have lips. We have mouths. We have tongues. It's our role in the choir to sing. But what if we don't? Jesus says, the stones will cry out because nature must receive her king. We are the rebels. We don't wish to hear Jesus' praise. Nature herself praises him, but we make nature our enemy. And she does get even with us on a regular basis. You can go to Yosemite Valley and be filled with awe. But if you go too close to the edge, she will take your life, as tourists find every year. Oh, let's play in the top of the waterfall. Do you know how strong that water is? Do you know how that water won't heed your cries for mercy? That's nature. Don't worship her. She's your sister. You've done her wrong. You'd better respect her. Nature is red in tooth and claw. Our king comes to us not like an, our angry sister, but like our older brother, who knows we need rescuing, not just from our angry sister, but from ourselves. We started the problem. We receive him one day and cry out to crucify him, not a week later. But from his cross, what will he say? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. What should we do? What should we ask for? That we play our part in returning the praise delivered by the Christmas angels. That's our role to play. That we reconcile with Sister Nature by reconciling with the maker of us both. When Jesus comes and walks upon the water and Peter takes the first steps, he's taking the first steps into the new creation. And we say, water will not yet hold us up. At least not like that. But it will. It will. When, as Romans says, the children of God are ready to be revealed. 
We anticipate that one day we will both praise with equal sincerity the trees of the field, the waters, the fields, the rivers, us with our words, the stars, the sky. We anticipate that one day we will both praise with equal sincerity and our relationship with nature will once again be set free from the disease we gave her. That's Palm Sunday. Let's pray. Lord, it's our part to voice the praise, to shout Hosanna, to declare him not just King of Jerusalem or King of Israel or King of people, but King of all nature. Lord, we wait for that day as both we and nature continue to live in the bondage we brought. But we see our King, and we see Him coming, and we see Him making the way for us to be made new. Help us to receive Him. May we praise Him. May the rocks just let get to be rocks, because we fulfill our call. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand?